Um, apologies for being a few minutes late. Uh, I had to, some difficulty into the meeting, but I think I managed. I'll just share a few slides with you just to um, give you a little bit of a flavor of a couple of the things that we've been, uh, been looking at. Um, so I hope you can see my slides now. Um, basically, I, I want to. Very simple. Very simple. Very simple. Great. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing at the OECD and talk a little bit about some of the implications which we think it might have. I think we are still, of course, in the middle of dealing with the pandemic. We're also still, I think we have to see a little bit what happens afterwards, but I do think we can probably see some things already and can see some implications already as well. Um, so what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit through um, a couple of, um, of elements of this discussion, I just need to move it. Um, so. so, a little bit about, I'll just provide you a little bit of context, and I want to talk a little bit about what the digital transformation really did, I think, in terms of uh, what happened in the COVID 19 crisis. And then spend probably most time talking a little bit about possible implications in, in all of this. Um, I'll take about 25 minutes, so I just want to leave plenty of time for discussion at the end so we can change a little bit and talk a little bit about, about some issues. Um, so I first think we all know there's been a really wide range of new digital technologies that have been emerging in the past few years, and I've just put a few on the screen here. Um, I think what's interesting, we've probably been talking about the digital economy for many years. Uh, but what's interesting at the moment is basically there are so many technologies coming at the same time so fast, affecting so many sectors of the economy that basically I think the impacts of all of that is a lot larger than what we've been seeing before. Second, I think it is important to say that this challenges policies in many different ways. And I've just put two examples on the slide. One is we've moved from an economy which was very much based on tangible assets. So basically on machinery, on buildings, on equipment, to one where most, a lot of firms now really rely more and more on intangible assets. And the examples here are companies like Uber, Google, Facebook, but also many pharmaceutical companies, and even a lot of others where a lot of the value now lies in things like intellectual property, branding, software, data, these types of things. Secondly, and what you see at the bottom is also services have become more important. What you're seeing there is basically a tractor, a robot tractor driving across a very large field. It's in Canada. I, it may happen that we have lost connection, but please be patient. Uh, it will come back soon. Yeah, I'll turn off my camera up if you don't mind. It um, may be a little better. Um, it always takes a lot of bandwidth. Um, if it will be easier, maybe uh, we can uh, use the slides and show the slides because uh, we have yeah. them. Maybe uh, easier. This always seems to be harder in WebEx than it is in Zoom. It always seems to take more, uh, more, more energy. So if if you wouldn't mind doing that, then I'll uh, stop sharing my screen and we'll we'll move to that. Very good. So we'll do that. Okay. Okay. I'll stop sharing. Okay, if we can just blow it up a little bit, perhaps put it on the slide view thing, then it would be good. Great. Uh, so, so the second example is really about um, services and how, you know, robot tractors, basically a lot of what they do at the moment as well, they collect data, they collect data on the soil, on the plants, on the, uh, the temperature, lots of other things. And a lot of that information is gathered and then provides services back to farmers to other customers to help provide um, services to, 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 to those in those industries. The policy, this raises all sorts of questions. And one of them uh, where the OECD is currently doing a lot of work is on taxes. And for instance, what do you tax when you have an economy which is increasingly intangible? How do you tax? 
because increasingly intangibles also can easily be moved across borders and can be located in many different countries, uh, which is much harder than when we had were dealing with an economy which is entirely tangible. There are other examples. Trade is really another area where we are have difficulties dealing with digital trade. It's 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 e it's much easier to deal with physical goods than it is with sort of things that are moving across borders. Uh, through the internet or to other types of uh, intangible ways. So there are lots of issues here that 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 come up. If we can go to the next slide, um, what we did at the OEC and that started some some years ago is really we had a big project where we were trying to look at these issues to improve basically what was really happening, improve basically on our understanding of this digital transformation, provide tools to policymakers to help them think through this and basically say, well, how can we be more uh, proactive, how can we be, be a little bit more looking forward on these issues uh, and, and, and be more also integrated in our thinking and also try to improve the policy making process itself. What was important in the OECD context is basically we involved a very large part of the OECD in this discussion, not just the people who are all uh, had been thinking about the digital economy for a long time, but every part of the OECD that was really dealing with this issue, including colleagues dealing with tax policy, investment policy, trade policy and so on to really try to think through some of the key issues. We go to the next slide. Um, and I think the also the other thing here was that we thought it was very important to develop a more integrated, a joined up approach. We basically felt that it was really necessary to look across issues, to join up the discussion across different parts of, the, of, 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 uh, of policy making. Uh, because of sometimes silos can really uh, not be, be, be very detrimental to how we deal with these issues. One example here is, uh, for instance, discussion of, of, of privacy. Uh, if you have a very uh, sort of um, sort of a, a legal perspective on privacy, then privacy is a very absolute right. If you're thinking about health policy as well, you may say, well, we need to find a way to also share data. We need to provide a way of also also. Uh, that, that helps to provide access to health data so we can improve better therapies, we can provide new ways of dealing with things. And that means that we need to sort of bring these issues together and talk across uh, different policy areas. There are also things that matter everywhere, like security, competition, skills. So we thought it was really important to try and work together on these issues at the OEC. Go to the next slide. And what we, we did is we developed a policy framework, which I'll, and there's a report on that, which was put out two years ago, but I, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail at the moment, but it had seven components. And I'll return to that later when I'm talking a little bit more about the implications of, of COVID-19. We'll go to the next, next slide. And then the next one, and talking a little bit about digital transformation. Well, I think what COVID-19 has done, and so the fact that we're now talking through virtual uh, means uh, is, is, is already an example, but it, what has happened is, of course, because of restrictions to physical contact, to teleworking and things like that, we've seen a real acceleration in the uptake of digital technologies, but also in the way we are working together. Uh, an example here is telework. Uh, this is data from, from Italy. Uh, and what you basically see is, is a couple of different points in, in every graph for different industries. You see the blue bar, which was an estimated potential of the number of people or the share of workers in a different sector that were expected to be able to work in different sectors. So you see up to 50% in the information communication industry. You see a little blue sort of line completely at the bottom in most cases, which was basically what was the share of workers pre-lockdown that was teleworking in those sectors. You see a little uh, triangle on the top in most cases, which is basically the people who were really working, teleworking during the lockdown. And then you see a round circle, which basically is the, the part of, of people that were teleworking a little bit after the most serious lockdown. So you've seen a real uptake of this, these types of technologies. A lot of people moved into teleworking, depending on the industry where you were in, depending on the activity. But we've also seen that when the lockdown sort of ended, uh, quite a few people that were still continued to, to telework because still restrictions were in place and also, but also in some cases, because uh, some of the benefits of teleworking have become perhaps a little bit more, more clear to, to, to many companies. We don't know where this will end up, but I think it's one sign of things that things are, are changing. We go to the next slide. 
an, another example is is basically from from a McKinsey study which looked at shopping behavior. I think many of you probably done more shopping uh, electronically uh, since during the COVID nineteen crisis and during the pandemic uh, than before. And what we see very clearly across countries, lots of customers basically have indicated that they've tried new shopping behavior. Uh, since COVID-19, but also, and that's the, the interesting part, the, the, the little uh, numbers on the top, a lot of them also say that, well, that's something which I'll continue to do, even if this is all over. Uh, so I will continue to do some of my shopping more online also in the future. We go to the next slide. Thank you. Just looking at the chat, chat I think you have me back. Um, and another example here is that, um, yeah, if we, uh, that one, uh, we've seen a real uptake in, of course, well, if you are teleworking, if you are engaged in more electronic commerce, if firms do more online, uh, in the internet is also struggling more and more with this. This is from uh, work which we did for the G20. Uh, we've seen a real pickup in, in sort of the, the amount of bandwidth needed uh, to really cope with the, the increase in demand. So lots of uh, countries had difficulties, telecommunications companies had to change to adjust to basically make sure that they were able to provide for uh, the massive increase in demand that was, was occurring. Uh, go to the next slide. Uh, we've seen, of course, an uptake in, in remote work programs. Uh, these are just a couple of examples of uh, Zoom, uh, or Skype, um, uh, WebEx is here, Slack, lots of others uh, where also particularly during the, 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 the sort of the, uh, the, the, the depth of, of the lockdown, more and more people were working on, online and more uh, remote working platforms were being needed. And the next one, and of course, an increase in e-commerce. These are just a couple of figures for the UK and for the EU, uh, where we've also seen a very sharp increase in the use of electronic commerce in, in, in many cases. There is more information on this becoming available. Uh, a lot of company, uh, countries are now doing more detailed surveys of their businesses, basically trying to figure out what happened. And we've seen in some cases that it's been mainly the companies that were more already using a lot of the internet, using a lot of digital technologies, and are now using even more, where some of the more sort of less digitally intensive companies probably haven't done quite as much to uh, sort of keep up with uh, the, the, the jump uh, which we've seen in quite a few countries. So this is just a couple of indicators to illustrate a little bit what has uh, been happening. We can talk more about that. I think we need still need to see a little bit what the evidence looks like if we have uh, have some more data. But this is these are some of the indicators which uh, tell us a little bit what's been been going on. So let me move to to policy. And if we go to the next slide, I, I want to use that framework a little bit again. Uh, I think it's important to say, well, the pace of all of this has accelerated. It's been going on for some time, as I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, but of course, since it's accelerated again and, and probably has gone a lot more quickly, it means that some of these policy issues be, are becoming more important and in some cases even more urgent. So if we go to the, the next one. I'll take you just to a couple of the examples here. Uh, one on access. I mean, if we all rely more on digital technologies, connectivity is becoming even more important, and it means that we need to make, to make sure that everybody is connected. If you're looking at the use by people, but also by companies, uh, there is a risk here that the SMEs, some of the, the more less technologically savvy companies, uh, risk falling behind even more. Innovation, I'll say a few words about that. Skills become even more important. There are questions about well-being, what that means for, for people uh, working more and more online. Uh, there are real questions about security, privacy, and, and other types of ways of making sure we can uh, trust what we are doing in, in, in the virtual environment. And there are questions about the market and, market and, the, and competition in the economy as well. Uh, so let me go through these things uh, quickly so we have enough time for discussion at the end. Um, if we go to the next one. Um, well, well, first, an example here is connectivity, and I don't want to show you too many slides, but there are still pretty big differences between uh, European countries, between OECD countries in connectivity. And this is basically just one example looking at fiber, fiber uh, high speed broadband connection between countries. But we have some countries, uh, Korea, Japan, a couple of smaller Nordic European countries, but also countries like Spain and Portugal where already many, many um, uh, people are connected through fiber connections. 
We have many other countries in Europe, particularly some of the largest countries that are still lagging behind in the use of fiber. And that's important because if we want more high speed applications, if we are seeing greater use of the internet, this is becoming more important. Secondly, if we go to the next slide, there are questions about certain groups in society. Uh, we know, for instance, that certain regions are not as well connected. Certain groups in terms of individuals are not as well connected. For instance, younger people, as you can see, almost all young people are connected, have, are, have good access. A lot of older people are not as well connected. A lot of people with lower incomes are not always equally well connected. Some people sometimes with lower levels of education aren't as well connected, but this is becoming more and more important to make sure that we do connect everybody and so that everybody can participate in this uh, digital economy and also uh, use uh, get some of the benefits from it. We go to the next one. Um, use, I think, is a second issue. I mentioned it already. Um, there's still very big difference across countries in terms of how firms, but also how people are using the digital technologies, using the internet. Uh, this is about big data analytics, which is basically a, a stepping stone to the use of artificial intelligence. Uh, and you see very big differences here across uh, European countries where we have this data from, from, from last year, uh, where uh, you know some countries, uh, quite a few businesses are already involved in this. In other countries, this is still very low. So again, there are questions, how are firms using these technologies and what are they basically doing with it to improve their performance? Uh, if we go to the next one, uh, a second one is, is really about also uh, SMEs. This is about cloud computing services. Uh, this is an important technology because cloud computing is basically means that you can sort of outsource a lot of your IT to, uh, to cloud computing firms like Amazon Web Services or others, Microsoft. Um, that's really good and helpful for small firms, but we see here that in many countries, small firms are still lagging behind in the use of these services, again, with a lot of differences across uh, countries in, in, in the OECD. Next one, please. Innovation, I think here, this is an interesting point as well. Uh, we've looked a little bit at how firms uh, invested or changed their investment in R&D during the COVID crisis. So, and we have three groups of firms here that you can look at. We have some of the digital firms in orange. We have some pharmaceutical firms in green in the middle, and we have some other firms made in the, in the automotive and, and aerospace industry on, on, uh, in blue on, on, on the right. You can see very diff large differences, of course, because the digital economy was doing so well. A lot of the uh, the software, the digital firms have really seen increase their investment in R&D also during the crisis. Uh, a number of pharmaceutical co companies have done the same also because there was, of course, a large demand for some of their uh, products. But in, the, in the, um, the car, the aerospace industry, a very different picture because, of course, demand there was, was much more subdued. They had much more difficulties. So what we, we may expect here, quite big differences between industries, between firms, and how this crisis will in affect innovation, and that will have impacts on, on, on the future, how we go forward on, on, on some of these technologies and what we may see here in, in, in the future. We go to the next one, a real issue here as well, a question about concentration. If we see some big firms uh, winning, uh, doing extremely well in this crisis context, that could add to the fact what we are already seeing in many industries at the moment, increased concentration, uh, 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 increasingly a more limited number of firms that are sort of important in, in different sectors of the economy. Next one, please. Fourth issue uh, is skills. Um, I think we all know that skills are extremely important. I think if we talk about uh, job insecurity, the fact that people may be losing their job in this digital economy, uh, skills are really the main response to that. Uh, countries are doing quite different, in, for instance, in terms of scientific achieve, achievement, in terms of how well students are doing in some core subjects. Uh, I'm not going to go into the detail. You see Japan, Korea, uh, and, 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 and Canada are doing extremely well on this specific uh, indicator. So basically, what is the sort of the talent that could be driving uh, this sort of digital economy? But what's more important as well, we often need different skills. We need new skills as well. It's not only about digital skills. We increasingly need softer skills as well that complement the technology that can help us work with the technology. Uh, and there as well, there are big differences across countries. If we go to the next one, 
uh, the OECD has um, a big survey which we do from, from time to time on uh, adult skills. It's called PIAC. Uh, I'm not going to give you the acronym, but it basically is, is a survey on adult skills. And there we can look at, for instance, the, the, the readiness to learn, creative thinking, uh, how people are doing in different countries in this area. And again, we see very large differences here across countries. So a question, how do we uh, sort of uh, improve those skills that will be uh, very much needed as well in this, in, in this economy? Second one, uh, if we go to the next one, I think, and, and then I'm, I'm, I'm getting there, um, is, is on gender. I think this is an, an, an important topic as well. I think particularly in the digital economy, we still see very big differences in uh, sort of the, the role of men and women in the digital economy, uh, where particularly, for instance, if you're looking at the ability of people to, 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 to code, to program, uh, we still see that women are in many cases lagging behind. And of course, that means that the people who are actually driving this digital economy are still in many cases men. Also, if you're looking at entrepreneurship in this, this economy, a lot of the, the, the companies are not our male startups are led by men, uh, not by, by, by women. So I think that is a concern that I think uh, increasingly we're looking at as, as well. Uh, fifth topic, the next one, please. Is about well being. Um, I think this is increasingly an issue uh, in many countries. This just basically shows you the average daily time spent on the, using the internet, mobile internet, and on social media in different countries. Uh, you see very large numbers here in many cases in many countries. Uh, we all spend uh, at least five, six hours a day on the internet. Uh, and of course, that raises also questions about our well being. In some cases, there's a lot happening on the internet that's good, but also things happening on the internet that are not so good. So how do you deal with that? And I think this is increasingly an issue. Uh, the discussion about social disinformation uh, is, is, is one element of that discussion. Next one, please, is about trust. Uh, I mentioned this information already, uh, lots of issues around security. If we all become more dependent on the digital economy, digital security, hacking, phishing, all sorts of other issues become more important. Privacy becomes more important, how we protect that, but also things like dealing with this information, fake news and so on become more important as well in, in many countries. And finally, if we go to the final one is, is the question uh, about markets. Uh, I mentioned competition already, but we've seen a little bit around the crisis in COVID-19. We've really seen fewer firms being created in some OECD countries. Uh, in other countries, it's picked up, but we see quite a few countries where lots of firms have basically uh, fallen out. It's been very difficult to create new companies. And that has questions, raises questions about the future that we are maybe missing a generation of, of, of entrepreneurs, new entrepreneurs that could be driving the economy forward. If we go to the next one, it also uh, is something which actually adds to the fact that we've already seen in many cases that the dynamism of the business sector has been trending down. We see fewer new firms being created, a uh, few newer uh, sort of um, uh, difficulties in, in, in many parts of the economy. So that's a little bit of an overview of, of what we, I think, are, are looking at in terms of some of the implications. So if we go to the, the next one, uh, just to try and start wrapping this up a little bit, I, I think first is, what are some of the issues perhaps Europe may need to think about? Well, first, I think, is around access. Connectivity in Europe is generally quite, quite high, but I think there's a real need to cover all social groups, firms, and regions. So there's still gaps. And I think it's really important that we try to address those gaps and also roll out fiber, roll out 5G to make sure that everybody has the ability to participate in the digital economy. Secondly, I think I mentioned the advanced use of these technologies is still low. Uh, it's difficult from some sometimes as well startups. We're not doing as, as well as some other parts of the world. There's a risk here of SMEs falling behind. So I think anything we can do to make it easier for firms to use these technologies and more advances on uses of these technologies is going to be very important. Thirdly, on innovation, Europe tends to have particularly is very good on science. Uh, you know, a lot of the, the sort of the, the science for things like artificial intelligence, for the bio industry, for many industries is often European, but we're not so good in turning that into innovation, into startups, and to new growth opportunities. So I think that's st still a challenge and something we can talk more about how we deal with that and how we move that forward. And I think market integration is going to be a very important part of that. 
Skills, uh, again, I mentioned that already. I think we have strong skills in quite a few European countries, but we also have challenges with new skills needs. Uh, we have the, the, the fact that we need a lot of people who are already uh, in the labor market who will need new skills. So how do we give people new skills, adult skills is, is not easy. I mentioned the, the, the problem I think we have with well-being where we need to look at and societal implications, issues about security, privacy, and data protection, uh, fake news, and also I think the market issues where um, e-commerce and digital trade offer new opportunities, but the competition is a real challenge. And then of course at the European level, there's a lot of discussion on this at the moment. We go to the, the next one. Um, I think more than ever, I think also we need more coordinated approaches, more whole of government uh, approaches, which is what we've been, been, been trying to say. You need to look at these issues, not one by one, but really trying to bring them together. Um, so if we go to the next one, um, I think uh, we also need to have support of, of, of evidence. Uh, we do a lot of work at the OECD on indicators. These are basically indicators that we have for about uh, 50, 60 countries at the OECD from our going digital toolkit, where you can basically look at these seven dimensions and see how different countries are, are doing. And, and next one, please. Um, and I think the final thing I'd like to mention here is that we also need to think about policy making itself. We need to think about how we make policy, uh, how we review policies, because we still in many cases have uh, policies that are based on sort of this older economy, this more physical economy on physical locations, uh, for instance, uh, there was a time when in some countries you couldn't have an electronic commerce company at home because basically your company, your, your, your residence was not sort of being assigned as being a place where you could do commerce. Basically, you had that, that problem that physical location was basically a barrier to some of the, the realities uh, that we are facing at the moment. I think there's also an issue that sometimes the regulations we put in place, the standards that we, that we put in place, uh, very quickly become obsolete if we have this rapidly changing technologies. So often we need to think about what types of regulation, how we regulate this type of economy. Uh, we see a lot of discussion about experimentation. Uh, countries are uh, using the term sandboxes, where you basically provide a safe space where companies can experiment with a technology, with a business, with a business model, with artificial intelligence or something else uh, to facilitate risk taking and innovation. Uh, I think we need to to look at policies much more frequently to make to ensure make sure that they are fit for purpose. We probably need to integrate much more uh, understanding of the digital transformation in government. And what we've seen in many countries is the integration of what are called CTOs, so chief technology officers within government, uh, geeks for government, and so on. So we see more of that need, I think, happening in many countries, and also a, a greater use of data and digital tools. For policy making itself is something I think that's going to be more important uh, going forward. Um, let me go to my final slide, which is basically just to provide you with uh, a few uh, hints to some of the things we've been doing. Uh, we've doing, been doing lots of shorter policy briefs linked to uh, the digital economy and COVID-19. Uh, you can find them on our website. Uh, doing, uh, and we put out a digital economy outlook in November, October last year, which goes in a lot of detail on some of these issues. We go to the next one. Uh, this is just a list of some of the, uh, the, the, the briefs we've been looking at, uh, the role of it, artificial intelligence, how we deal with privacy. Uh, for instance, when we are all using apps to, to help uh, deal with COVID-19, how we deal with security, how we deal with teleworking, e-commerce. We've been trying to look at all these issues and you can uh, find more of them online. And my final slide is, is basically just to uh, go to the next one. It's just basically a couple of links to some of the reports which we've been doing and recently also one uh, more specifically looking at the innovation discussion as well. So uh, let me stop there and hopefully uh, have given you a little bit of food for thought and some food for uh, discussion uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pirat, for this very dense and very rapid presentation. I think it was so uh, full with uh, 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 with information and with opinions and with uh, uh, with uh, statements that uh, uh, if you would share, uh, we will share it with the students because it was a bit too too, too rapid to really digest everything very very much. 
Uh, normally, we've got some questions from uh, students. Uh, I'm uh, looking at the room. Uh, yes, please come to the stage, and uh, then you will be seen and heard. Hello, um, thank you for your intervention. I was just wondering, since in the beginning you mentioned the importance of the new intangible and digital services industry, and uh, like these days, lots of talks are being held about uh, introducing international um, taxes, uh, you know, like the 21%. Uh, it's not really a question, but rather like uh, we'll be curious about your opinion on this. Do you think it's going to work through what is going to be the rate and so on? I, I don't have an opinion about it because it, this is a part of, I mean, the OECD is very heavily involved in it. Our tax colleagues are basically trying to uh, work at also G20 level on this. I think there is a hope that we will maybe finally get a deal. Uh, I mentioned it a little bit because I think it is it is very important. I mean, I think you know, there's a, lo a lot of, I think, um, following the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, there was a lot of, there were a lot of people saying, well, you know, it's not particularly if we have many of these digital firms that are not being taxed because of the way the tax system works. So I think there's hope now that um, also with um, a different uh, U.S. administration, but also a number of other developments, that we might see some movement here and possibly could get a deal. Uh, so uh, something that is is important and, and uh, will will need to be, be, be looked at very carefully. Um, I think political support is growing, but this is the sort of thing you really need to do this across the world. So it, it is something where uh, King the OECD is working closely, of course, with the European Union, uh, all the European Union countries, uh, 23 of us, uh, three, 23 of them who are also OECD members, uh, but also at the G20 level and beyond. So to make sure that this is something that could work uh, and that uh, progress can be made. So I do hope that uh, this is something that will, will work. Um, uh, but I'm not sort of the one who's sort of in the middle of that discussion to give you a lot of detail on on, uh, on where this is going, but I do hope it will work. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we understand it very well. Uh, is anyone else? If not, I would uh, put myself a question because I think uh, uh, among the information that you have uh, made is a very interesting fact. I was uh, really a bit surprised by seeing uh, Brazil not very good on skills, on other things, but very good in using uh, internet and social media. So I think there's a discrepancy. And it's not necessarily clear whether using internet and social media, it means providing something uh, uh, as a tool, is sufficient for really taking it to the purposes of productivity and uh, uh, developing economy. Uh, you have been mentioning also regulation. Very often we are discussing regulation in context of uh, internal domestic market or domestic in a sense in the European market. But internationally, uh, what is your view how it should be discussed? Where is the best place to discuss? Is it uh, is it uh, OECD, which is uh, mostly a discussion place, but less regulatory place, or WTO, because it's digital economy and the question of uh, international uh, uh, exchange, in a sense, uh, in this particular field, or ITU, uh, uh, where it's about more infrastructure, but it's also, or maybe it should not be discussed, uh, but it's uh, uh, maybe nowhere, because it's developed uh, by uh, market forces. So what is your view about it? Thank you for a couple of interesting questions. I mean, first on, on social media, Brazil, I mean, I, I, I think it's probably important to distinguish a little bit when I spoke about access to dis discuss, uh, to distinguish a little bit what we have uh, in countries like Brazil, but also quite a lot of other uh, emerging developing economies, an enormous amount of use of mobile devices. So a lot of people in Brazil, for instance, I think I'm not quite sure what the average is, but there are quite a few countries in Latin America where the average, uh, you know, for 100 people, for 100 inhabitants, there are about 150 mobiles. Uh, and a lot of them are smartphones. So people are using smartphones, of course, to connect to social media, to do lots of other things. It is important as well if you're thinking about productivity, but for productivity, it's very important also what happens in firms and how firms are using this technology. 
And, and there you often, mobiles play a role there as well, but you often need fixed connections. You need networks, you need uh, real infrastructure to uh, to help uh, people move, 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 uh, move forward. And there, of course, many uh, emerging developing economies like Brazil are much further behind in terms of uh, their use of these types of technology. So mobiles help, and I think they're very important for people to connect and for uh, to, to make it possible for uh, to benefit from a lot of technologies and, and, and um, to benefit what's happening on the internet, they don't do everything. And even if you have a, uh, you know, you, you need fixed networks as well because your mobile uses a lot of data. And now and again, it needs to basically connect to a physical network to uh, to throw that back to 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 the network. So uh, you need both. And uh, what is the problem still in many emerging developing country economies is that that a more fixed network isn't quite that well developed yet. And we did a review of telecommunications policy of Brazil actually last year, where we looked in, in a lot of the details on what is needed in, in, in that context. Um, on, on regulation, um, that's a, a question of with, with many different aspects. Um, I think there are different levels and discussions on regulation. Um, it, it is also a discussion that happens at many different levels. Uh, we in the OECD is not a regulator as such, so we, we don't regulate much. We do, uh, our main role is to work with countries to uh, to look at, well, what is good practice? What works? Uh, how does it work? Uh, so that we can provide uh, input to discussions at home that we, you know, that countries can look at basically how they can improve regulations themselves, but also that they can try to work together to harmonize regulation and make sure that regulations uh, don't become a barrier for uh, for trade or other things across borders. So that's also where our interaction comes in with other international organizations, some of them who are more regulate, uh, regulatory uh, involved, uh, like uh, the World Trade Organization and, and others. Um, we, we do, I think, um, we don't regulate. We do provide a lot of what we call soft law at the OECD. So we do uh, put out a lot of sort of um, recommendations to our countries uh, that they then use to, to, to think about their own regulations. And we're currently uh, also developing some guidance to countries in this area to uh, help them in their thinking about regulation. Um, so that's probably a, a couple of, of, of dimensions on, on, on regulation. Uh, but I do think this is an area which uh, is really in need of, of change. I've, I've indicated uh, a few reasons why I think it needs to change in terms of how we uh, anticipate, how we think about the impact of new technology on regulation, uh, how we think ahead a little bit more, how we are trying to be a little bit more flexible, a little bit more experimental in regulation. You need regulation at some point in time to provide sort of you know, uh, clarity to businesses, uh, but also to protect certain interests. I mean, we have a discussion on AI regulation going on at the moment in Europe. Uh, so you will need some of that at, at some point in time. But also probably uh, with new technologies, you need to have other types of guidance a little bit earlier on. So uh, to give you one example, uh, two years ago, there was an agreement between OECD member countries and, and quite a few others for a set of principles on artificial intelligence. So we basically had principles which basically said, well, this is how we need to deal with this technology in terms of uh, security, but also in terms of robustness, transparency, accountability of these te types of technologies. So we need to think about how we make this technology work. Uh, but what many countries said at that time, this technology is still moving so quickly, we don't think we can regulate it still at this this, this stage quite yet. And of course, that's the, an ongoing discussion uh, that we're seeing play out in, in Europe at the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I see that Beatrice, uh, Professor Dumont, would like to put a question. Even she is close to you in Paris, so uh, uh, but we are using this method of connecting you, Beatrice. Oh, okay, sorry. Thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, if I'm correct, uh, in the data you presented to us uh, regarding uh, the use of uh, digital technology, uh, there was no reference to China. Uh, and I think it was similar when you presented data on com digital companies, uh, no reference to China. 
Uh, and once again, I mean, if you are traveling in China, heaven in uh, the remote part of China, uh, you see that everyone is paying with a smartphone, something we don't do in Europe, we don't also do in the United States and so on. Uh, we also saw, uh, I think it was last week, uh, you had a request from the China, uh, from the China Bank, well, from the Chinese authority uh, to on financial, to transfer the data uh, to uh, a Chinese uh, bank. And what we see is that we have a complete different set of regulation. Uh, I mean, in Europe and United States, we're going to, uh, to pay very much attention to the so-called GAFA. Uh, but in China, uh, the situation is very different. And don't you think that what we are saying in a, in a, in a way is a kind of uh, a model of state innovation? Because we know that you have a lot of subsidies uh, which are given to innovation in China and so on. Uh, versus a model where in United States in Europe, uh, you would have a, a market model of innovation. And in that case, you, you may, we may face some, uh, some competition issues, especially since we see uh, that the Chinese are, are developing some database in Europe as well. Uh, and I mean, based on the data, the Chinese data, which is of course much more bigger uh, than what you can have in, in United States and, and Europe. I mean, uh, don't you think it might be an issue uh, I mean, in, in the years to come, because I mean, you know, the kind of regulation is very different. Uh, and uh, I mean, you were also speaking uh, about sandboxes, uh, but you know, in Europe, I mean, you, you only find sandboxes in Asia and in United Kingdom, but United Kingdom is not part of the EU. Uh, so my feeling is that uh, we, we're starting to, I mean, we're lagging behind in some ways when it comes to uh, uh, to fintechs, uh, and I really think it's uh, it's worrisome, you know, um, because I mean we're focusing on the I mean on the supposedly bad guys, so the GAFA, uh, but we're not looking at what is happening in some other parts uh, of the world. That's an interesting question, and it has made quite a few dimensions to it. So let me let me try to pick a, on a few bits of it. First, first I, I think it's important to recognize China, and I think particularly when we're talking about large platforms. We, we did a report on platforms um, about a year and a half ago. And one thing we did there is pay a lot of attention to large Chinese platforms, because I think, as you say, I mean, there's a lot of attention for the American platform. There's not a lot of attention always for Alibaba, Tencent, um, and some of the other mm -hmm. Chinese platforms. So we tried to look at those platforms as well. And I think you're right in saying that um, there is uh, quite a different approach uh, in China um, to uh, the digital economy in, in, in many different ways. I mean, the whole discussion about privacy, artificial intelligence, and so, um, uh, you know, I, I think we've, uh, you can see a very different approach, and that is also something you're seeing very clearly in the international discussions uh, on the digital economy, uh, where there are quite uh, large differences between um, China, on the one hand, uh, European countries a little bit, and also the United States, where uh, sometimes uh, there are differences between Europe and, and the United States as well. Um, so I, I do think we need to recognize that. Um, of course, the influence of the state in China is also a very large one and, and um, quite different from, from what we are seeing in, in the European context. I think Europe is um, increasingly becoming uh, and uh, has taken a bit the position of being uh, a, an important regulatory power in, 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 in the digital economy and you know, on the GDPR. I think it's become uh, an important standard internationally. Uh, I think the discussion at the moment on the regulations on AI or the possible regulation of AI, which we still have to see what it plays out, is also an, another example. Um, so I, I do think there are tensions here. Uh, we have tensions as well, as you know, about digital security with the position of Huawei. Uh, so there are um, there are definitely tensions in the international economy and uh, in, in in this in this space, and that's definitely also something that we're we're seeing quite uh, quite clearly in our work. Um, on on sandboxes, I, I do think um, they're a bit more prevalent than you 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 say. I mean they. They started in the fintech sector, and the UK was an important player in there. But there are sandboxes being used in many other areas as well at the moment, where uh, you know there are sandboxes around the use of um, uh, of, of, of uh, self-driving vehicles. In some cases, there are sandboxes around sort of specific uh, specific uses of technologies in a certain location. So there's a lot of that going on uh, because the issue is in many cases that we don't quite quite know. 
uh, it's very hard to regulate a technology that is still evolving very quickly where you don't know where it's going. And I think to ex by, by experimentation, by having these sandboxes, you can learn a little bit. You can basically figure out how it works, but do it in a safe environment. Because that, basically, that's the word sandbox says, uh, to try and do it in a safe environment so you provide some protections around it. Um, I haven't answered all the details, but I, I hope it helps a little bit in, in terms of uh, some of the, the, the points that you, you raised. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, now we've got a question from Niklas, uh, from online student. Yes, please, thank Niklas. You. Thanks very much for the insightful uh, and dense talk. Um, you talked a lot about uh, innovation and the chances of growth of digitalization and stuff like that. And at the same time, I was thinking, or I was wondering about maybe from your point of view, an, invo uh, an informed assessment uh, assessment of the development of unemployment and the poverty risk, um, given the fact that one might assume that the quantification of the marginal product of labor, which should translate into wages, is maybe more difficult in to assess the impact of digitized jobs, jobs that work much more in the service sector. Um, and maybe give an outlook on that and, and also possible countermeasures. I mean, you talked a lot about skills, a lot about education. Um, do you think that those measures can suffice to counteract those measures or do you think there has to be more uh to to close the gap uh that might uh be created like providing more public goods or creating uh unconditional general incomes or uh in in the process of digitization thanks very much thank you that's a that's a big question and an important one um what, what's interesting i i think we, we do know there will be jobs lost. Uh, what's interesting is to see as well, there are lots of being, jobs being created. And I think we're seeing more evidence at the moment, increasing evidence in quite a few countries. There are actually quite a lot of jobs being created as well. Um, so uh, on, on, on balance, um, at least the evidence that we have at the moment is that we don't expect actually there will be a massive increase in unemployment because of digital economy. Uh, we just don't see that happening in the data at the moment. Uh, I think it's important to think in that context as well that many OECD countries, uh, also many European countries, think about Germany, think about Japan, think about China, are dealing with aging populations. So basically we will have a declining workforce in many countries, uh, which, which will be something that also digital technologies will need to compensate for. Um, so I think on balance, we don't expect that there will be job losses. The issue will be that the jobs that we will have in the future will be quite different from the ones we have right now. Uh, and that, of course, means that that's why I, I emphasize skills a few times, because I think that basically means we need to find ways of giving people different skills, new skills, at least for those people who can have those skills and, 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 and who, can, who, can, who, can, who can get them. Um, and there we do have a real problem. Uh, we do, for instance, collect data at the OECD on uh, the share of the population in different countries that is involved in training. Very little, very low, low, uh, low levels of training in many countries. And most of the training goes to the type of people on this call. So a lot of the training in OECD countries goes to people who already have high levels of skills. Uh, it, it, it goes to people who are already relatively high levels of income. It doesn't go to people with lower levels of income and lower levels of skill. So that I think is the real challenge is how do we make sure that the people who are probably most likely to be affected by all of this, how do we give them the skills to uh, to 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 cope with this, this digital transformation we're going to see? Um, other point I wanted to make is that um, you know what's interesting to see there are people who've been looking at previous sort of big transformation we've seen in certain industries. So they basically looked at other. Uh, big industrial revolutions. And, and you do typically see when a new technology comes in, you see also that because the price is going, going down in many cases, we see an enormous surge in demand and we see lots of new jobs being created. It's only a little bit later that, 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 uh, that jobs fall back. We hardly ever see any job sort of really completely or any occupation, sorry, any occupation fully disappearing. Uh, there's been some interesting work in the United States on this, for instance, where the only occupation that was really completely has gone in the United States uh, since the Second World War was the person who used to run the lift in a, in a building. So basically, you know, you had somebody who pressed the button when you were going into a high-rise building. There was somebody there who pressed the button for you, who took you up to your floor and said hi. 
that is the only job that has fully disappeared in the United States. Almost all occupations still exist, far fewer of them, uh, but a lot of occupations haven't completely disappeared. So we see changes probably in the mix. Uh, we will see some jobs disappear or decline, uh, but we don't probably, uh, and, and, and again, I think that the real issue is about skills. The other point uh, is, I think, is about social protection and labor protection measures, because that will be important too. Uh, you mentioned universal basic income. Lots of discussion on that. I think in the European context, I'm not sure if that's really the way to go, because many European countries have reasonably well-developed social protection systems and social security systems. Um, so it's more of a discussion which you see in the United States at the moment, where those systems are not as well-developed as, as they are in many European continental European countries, at least. Thank you very much. Uh, just... uh, I, I think that this question was motivated by the fact that some students have got hesitation whether they have selected a proper school and proper skills, and they now wonder whether they will be not replaced by artificial intelligence. I can assure you there's plenty, and uh, you have what you have said, there's plenty of space. This profession that you are preparing for is not going to disappear. Uh, any more questions? Okay, uh, just a comment on, on what you, yeah. you just said. Uh, if you look at the studies, uh, for instance, Goodhart, what is showing is that we've got a massif massification of higher education, so more and more graduates, and it has a negative impact on salary. Uh, it also means that some of them uh, will have to take, you know, some uh, low-paid job and with, uh, with no interest at all. Um, and coming to that issue, I was wondering, uh, when it comes to metrics, uh, for instance, uh, for innovation, uh, I mean, uh, you have some metrics how to, to make a distinction between quantity and quality of innovation. But uh, how do you proceed uh, when it comes to a uh, job of the future, I would say? What kind of metrics are you going to use as your ECD? Uh, Good question. Um, we do a lot of work. We do a lot of empirical work at the OECD. So there's a lot of work on measure, on metrics, on measurement, on evidence building, um, and that's the type of work which never ends. You always need to look at new uh, tools. You need to try and basically find the best possible evidence because also if you find more evidence, the questions change and, and so on. Um, so I think we can look at, for instance, uh, the number of jobs. We've done that. We've tried to look at basically what are the types of jobs that will probably decline? What are some of the occupations that might decline? What are some of the occupations that might increase, which is a lot less certain, of course. Um, so we can do that. We can also look, we do a lot of work as well at quality of jobs. So we're trying to understand what are the quality of jobs, what are the wages that are associated with it, the skill level. Uh, and we're doing a lot of work, and for instance, I showed you some of the indicators on, on adult skills from our PX survey, uh, mainly because uh, a lot of the traditional education statistics don't really help us in knowing people actually know. So the only way you do that is basically by going into detailed surveys and, and, and you know, having large scale surveys, which we do to try and sort of understand better what, what, what people actually know. and. Uh, in terms of the types of skills they, they they have, so I think that's 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 really important to try and and, and get to that. Um, you you do raise I think an important question about what we have seen in many OECD countries is uh, not all but in some uh, is is an increase in inequalities um, since the uh, for some time um, and um, in some cases the pandemic probably has increased that a little bit further. Um, there are many reasons for that, uh, and, and there is a lot of work which we've done on, on, on that in, in the past. So I think we need to look at that as well. And again, I think um, uh, how the labor market works in, in that is important, uh, but also how the economy works more generally. So, for instance, we've done we're doing a lot of work at the moment trying to understand what's happening within firms, and we find increasingly that the most productive firms, of course, also pay the highest wages. So what we are seeing more and more is that uh, there is a, a shift. Uh, from the more uh, sort of the people with higher skills all move to uh, a certain type of firm and you have lots of firms being left where people are left with lower skills and also with lower wage levels. Uh, so there are real issues around that. I think that, we're, that we need to understand better and, and, and try to develop policy responses to. And we've seen a real discussion and increase in discussion at the OECD and I think beyond on 
uh, what's called inclusive growth to basically make sure how do you develop growth which really brings uh, is is beneficial to everybody and that we try to bring people along in that and that is about wages it's about sort of um, uh, being able to benefit from it from from the economy and I only spoke about that a little bit now in the context of digital economy, where I think things like access and connectivity and skills are important elements. But of course, the discussion goes a lot beyond that and, and, and looks at other and you need to look at quite a few other dimensions then as well. Thanks very much. Yes, uh, thank you very much as well. And uh, any other person willing to put a question? Yes, please come to the microphone. I have a question. Um, my name is Astin, a question related to what you just mentioned uh, in terms of wages and, and work. Uh, and I was wondering, what is your view on this idea to maybe shift in terms of um, taxes, for example, uh, the balance a bit away from taxing wages, um, so actual people working uh, towards um, ideas to, to tax, uh, I don't know, uh, data or um, digital means? That goes a little bit beyond my range of work, I'm afraid. So, it, it, because that, that's again a very complicated discussion. I, I do think we, uh, you know, countries are at the moment really trying to think very carefully about their tax base and also about the stability of that tax base. So certain certain things, if you tax them, um, you can tax them for a while, but then if the issue disappears, then suddenly you're left with without taxes. So for instance, um, you know, I think uh, we will probably see an increase in things like carbon taxation, environmental taxation for a while. But if we do that properly, uh, then at some point in time, the problem will go away and we wouldn't be gaining any taxes from that anymore. So I think you need to look a little bit at what, what are sort of the stable sources of, of, of income that you can get from taxation, uh, which is one of the reasons why people often have taxes on uh, value added taxes, uh, you know, VAT, uh, why we often have labor taxes, uh, why we often have certain other taxes that are sort of more, um, uh, that are relatively stable. Um, there is a lot of discussion at the moment, I think, on things like wealth taxes, uh, there is a discussion on do we have our corporate taxes right? Uh, do we have the levels of income taxes in certain countries right? Uh, so I think I think those are all elements of of the discussion. But I'm uh, unfortunately it, it's a little bit beyond what I tend to look at typically. Uh, so uh, I would have to refer you to some of the OECD work on that to uh, to to uh, to respond better because it's it's uh, it's it's a complex discussion as well. And I don't want to uh, go into too much depth on it. But thank you for the question. Yes, thank you very much. I think that our time is uh, more or less that uh, finished what we have been allocating. So it is uh, time to slowly wrap up. Uh, I wanted to thank you very much on behalf of uh, students who obviously uh, uh, look at these issues with a great interest as a younger generation than uh, ourselves. And uh, obviously it is a very fascinating uh, 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 a set of new problems and you have been very uh, instrumental to develop uh, concepts and ideas related to that. So thank you very much for that on behalf of everyone that was uh, following in this virtual team. Obviously we would like to meet you in person, so if it would be possible we would like to go to OECD, maybe with this group it's not possible but maybe next year and to, uh, to see and to discuss or to welcome you here in uh, Bruges. Happy, happy to, uh, to discuss that. We can always uh, try that. We, we do have uh, visitors quite frequently. Unfortunately, there's nobody in the buildings at the moment. We're all working more or less at home. So, but uh, in the future, um, that, that could be something that we could, uh, could explore with you. So uh, please drop a line and you can see what we can do. And, uh, and pleasure. I, I know my, my, my presentation was a bit dense, but I just wanted to give you uh, a little bit of thoughts and things to think about and to look at and to have a conversation with you about it, about a couple of things. So uh, I enjoyed it and uh, happy to chat again sometime. The presentation was very useful and also you have uh, given additional uh, links to work of OECD, which will be very useful for students. Thank you very much. Great. You're welcome. And, uh, bye bye. Yeah, bye. And we are ending with that uh, uh, our virtual study trip. 
I wanted to check with 